Lacey Cornelson, Project Coordinator for PEAK 2.0. Across the country, a movement is underway to change the way we care for elders living in long-term care, away from the medical model to new innovative approaches such as person-centered care. Kansas has been a leader in this movement, but we still have much work to be done to make person-centered care the norm in our state. This video is designed to bring information about person-centered care right to your buildings and get conversations started on the subject. This video will also help us to shape a shared understanding of person-centered care in our state. Homes in Kansas who are interested in implementing person-centered care or, or who have already begun implementing person-centered care should join PEAK 2.0. Person-centered care is a philosophy that changes the focus of caregiving from accomplishing tasks to emphasizing the person. As a result, the resident's experience living in long-term care homes is different. Let's explore how it might be different. Let's start considering what life might be like as a resident living in a home that provides care from a medical model. To make this personal, let's consider that you suddenly need 24-hour care in a nursing home. What would it be like? Rise and shine. It's time to get up. What? What time is it? It's 6 o'clock a.m. Let's get up and get into the bath before it gets busy. It's still dark outside. It's how we do things. Breakfast is at 7.30 a.m. We don't want to be late, now do we? The nice young man bustles around the room getting stuff ready for the bath. He has worry lines on his forehead as he frantically moves about. I wonder why he is in such a hurry. What is he worried about? Am I a bother? He helps me out of bed and into the bathroom. As I sit on the toilet, I hear him in my room making my bed, picking things up, and getting into my closet. I wonder what he is getting in there. I hear him sigh to himself. Is my stuff messy? He comes back into the bathroom and helps me down to the whirlpool room. I begin to notice that it's chilly. I hope the bath is warm. Goodbye, says the CNA. I'm confused. Where is he going? I thought he was going to give me a bath. I hear another voice. Okay, let's get you in the bath, honey. Who are you? I'm Barb. I do baths here in the mornings. Oh, I thought the other guy was going to do it. Oh, you mean Joe. He works out on the floor, says Barb. I don't get it. What's the floor? <laughs> Oh, honey, I mean he does cares out with other residents, like getting them ready for the day. Let's get you in the bath, okay? She says as she starts taking off my clothes. It's cold in here, isn't it? I'm hot from being in here all morning. I'll try to get it a little warmer. The water in the tub feels nice and warm. I finally start to relax a bit. Then I hear a door open. Oh, no, who is it? I think to myself. Barb, I have another one out here waiting for you. Okay, we're about done. Barb says back. Wait a minute. I have to get out. I'm finally warm. It's time to get out now. Others are waiting. Barb says to me. Well, it was nice for a while. Barb helps me out of the tub and dries me off. I'm suddenly freezing again and longing for my covers. Barb dresses me in the clothes Joe picks out of my closet. I notice that the outfit he chose is not one I normally wear together. I wish I could pick a different shirt. I guess it'll be fine. Barb then pushes me in my wheelchair out into the hallway. Wait right out here for Joe to come back and get you. He's on his way down. Okay, everybody. How long will he be? I'm still freezing. Should I head to my room and wait for him there? I don't want to make trouble, but Joe is taking a while. There you are. Let's go get dressed. Joe says as he whisks me down the hall to my room. Why are we in such a hurry? The clock says 6.45. Breakfast doesn't start until 7.30. We get to my room and Joe helps me put on my makeup and fix my hair. He tells me to head to the dining room for breakfast. It is about 7 a.m. I sit in my room waiting for the dining room to open. What should I do to kill some time? I turn on the TV and catch the morning news. At 7.25, I decide to make my way to the dining room. As I make my way down the hall, I hear a woman yelling for help in her room. Help! Should I see what she Nobody needs? Help! Another resident comes up beside oh, me and leans help! over. She's always hollering about something. Don't worry about it. I feel a little guilty just leaving her without checking, but I continue on to the dining room. What's your name? I say to the resident I had just met. 
but she didn't even hear me over the noise. So I go on to the dining room and sit down at a table with my name on it. There are three other ladies sitting there. I wonder if they will be nice. What was it like to imagine yourself a resident in your nursing home? What would you change if you had to live in the nursing home where you work? Now you might be thinking to yourself, I work really hard. I do the very best I can. The residents here, I love them with all of my heart and I do my very best to meet their needs. You're right. You are doing the very best you can under the medical model framework. But what if I told you there's a different way? A way that drastically changes the experience from the elder's perspective. And it changes how you work. We will spend the rest of this video exploring the different way. It's called person-centered care. Person-centered care requires a shift in our organization's values and beliefs about what quality of care is. In long-term care, we have historically emphasized high-quality clinical care, but it's not enough. In person-centered care, quality of life is equally as important as quality of care. Because of this, person-centered care requires deep systems changes and personal transformation transformation from the heart. That means it is more than implementing programs that turn us into person-centered care organizations. It means we undergo changes within us, within our organizations, that change the way we interact, the way we behave, and the way we do business. It is a comprehensive change. Let's begin exploring the four key areas of person-centered care, or as PEAK 2.0 calls them, domains resident choice, staff empowerment, home environment, and meaningful life. Self-determination is the most fundamental aspect of life. We, as adults, make choices every day about how we're going to spend our day, what we're going to wear, what we're going to eat, who we're going to spend our time with. Person-centered care is all about choice real choice, not token choice. Real choice is when adults choose how to live. They make those choices of what time they're going to get up, what time they're going to go to bed, what they're going to eat, who they're going to eat with, and how they're going to spend their leisure time, just to mention a few. Each one of us makes these choices every day, but as people move into our communities, those choices tend to be taken away. We get people up according to our staffing or our schedule. We make people go down to meals three times a day. We put people down at night to sleep. What happened to their choices? As they move across our thresholds, those get trumped by our schedules, our systems, and our procedures. Take a moment to think about what you did this morning when you got up. What did you have to eat or drink? Did you stop to read the newspaper or maybe check a favorite website? Did you get dressed before or after you ate breakfast? Could you do those things if you lived in the nursing home where you work now? If the answer is yes, good for you. But if the answer is no, we still have some work to do. Someone once said the only thing that should change about a person when they move to a nursing home is their address. And that's really what this is all about. This goes to the core of person-centered care. It focuses on the person, the individual, and it supports the person when they make a choice, good or bad. It's a normal part of life. It's unrealistic to think that we can eliminate all risk for the people that we serve. We live with risk every day, and it should be the same thing for our residents. People must have the right to make their own decisions, whether they're good or bad. And who are we to decide what's a good or a bad choice? Each person is a unique individual who must be treated as such with dignity and respect, even when they're making what we think might be a bad choice. Think about when you go to see your doctor. Most, if not all of us, listen to what they say, that we should eat the right foods, that we should exercise 30 minutes a day, maybe quit smoking. And as we leave the office, we decide, yeah, 
I'm not really going to do that. Well, then why do we label our residents who choose not to follow the physician's orders as non-compliant or refusing care? Or how about when we default decision making to the durable power of attorney or the adult children, generally the daughter? When we do that, the residents are no longer living their lives. They're living the lives of the durable power of attorney or their child's life. Dr. Bill Thomas, founder of the Eden Alternative, says we must not succumb to the belief that the more confused a person is, the more rights they have to give up. It is for these people especially that we need to become advocates. We need to learn what are their hopes, dreams, and desires, and how do we make that happen for them. To honor choice is really about returning control to the people who live in our communities. Letting go of hospital-based scheduling can be scary, particularly for those of us who've worked in long-term care for an extended period of time. But you're not eliminating schedules. You're just changing the schedule from the hospital-based schedule that we're used to to the schedule of the people that you're serving based on their choice, their routines, and their preferences. Medications are still given, but they're given when the resident wants them, not according to the pharmacy's routine schedule. Treatments and therapy are provided, but that is when it works into the resident schedule, not in the middle of an activity they've been waiting for a month to see or during their favorite television program. Baths or showers of choice are given at a time and the way that the resident wants to have it versus being assigned a bath or shower based on what room they live in. People still get their meals, but they get them when they're hungry or when they want something to eat not because the cook has the meals ready at 7.30, 11.30, and 4.30 for an hour. The main principle of person-centered care is that a resident's choices and preferences should always be considered. What if a person wants to sleep until 10 in the morning? What's the issue with that? Are you concerned about their nutrition? What if somebody wants two meals a day? How do we make sure that they maintain their weight? That's the key issue. How can you honor choice if a lady wants to wear her pajamas to the dining room, but your corporate policy says that's not allowed? What if a couple wants a cocktail before dinner, just like they've done for the last 65 years of their marriage? How do we make that happen? In a person-centered home, anything is negotiable, as long as it's legal, healthy, and safe. We need to learn what's important to the person and assess that for safety, uh, remembering that all adults have the right to make choices that might end up not being the best choice for them. Okay, so all this sounds good. You're thinking, well, that's great, but how in the world do we make it happen? One thing you can do is create a way of life preference list that asks people about things that are significant to them and how they spend their their, their days as they move into your community. This identifies their routines, their leisure activities, maybe dietary preferences, favorite foods. Some homes will ask what your comfort food is and make sure that it's served on the very first day that you live there. Pretty powerful message. Some communities have social services complete this list. Other have the direct care partners, otherwise known as the CNAs, complete the list. It's up to you to decide. Then you take this information, you put it into the care plan, you put it into the nutritional preference care plan, you put it into the CNA's care plan. So they can follow through with the choices that the person has already expressed. Having this readily avail available helps them do this without having to ask the resident again. And it tells the resident, I know you, I know how you like things, which is a very powerful message. Imagine how you would feel if someone brought you your coffee first thing in the morning at the time that you wanted to get up, made the way you like it with two Splendas and a half and half, and handed you the newspaper. What's the message there? The message is, I know you, I know how you like things, and I'm going to honor your choice. How about how you get your makeup on a certain way? You have a preference for how you do that, or food preferences. How about if the first time you got your mashed potatoes, it didn't have gravy on it because you don't like gravy? All of this says, we hear you, 
we know you, and we respect you. But you may be thinking, we've got 120 people living here. How in the world are we going to know what these preferences are all about? There's only one way to do that, and that is with consistent staffing. Having the direct care partners work with the same individuals on a daily basis is the only way that you're going to develop that kind of relationship, that kind of companionship that is necessary to provide person-centered care. It's through that relationship that the direct care partners know about what makes a person happy, what makes them sad, what a favorite food is, how they like to have their room arranged, all very powerful messages to the individual. You cannot succeed at person-centered care if you do not have consistent assignments. And you cannot expect your care partners to know the preferences of 20 or 30 people. But they can learn the preferences of a smaller number of people, 6 or 8 or 10, depending on how your community is set up. Each of us is an individual, as is the people that we care for. And by the time we enter our teens, most of us have established a personal hygiene routine as to how we bathe, how we get dressed in the morning, how we start our day. When the same care partner is providing that care every day for the residents, they learn those routines and can provide that care exactly as the person has done for many, many years. Do you have a favorite restaurant or favorite store? Do you ever go someplace and they bring you what you want because they know what you like? How does that make you feel? Pretty special, I'm guessing. And that's the feeling that person-centered care can bring to the people that we serve. Honoring choice doesn't mean you can't provide the care. It means that you provide the care the way the individual wants it provided. Remember, we don't think ourselves into a new way of acting. We act ourselves into a new way of thinking. Try it. We know you will like what you see. Thank you. Hi there. I'm just very honored to be here today to have this opportunity to visit with you about staff empowerment. That's something that we're very excited about. And staff empowerment is such an exciting part of person-centered care. But what does it mean to be empowered? And so when we think of staff empowerment, we think about how staff empowerment then enhances the lives of the folks who live here, as well as the lives of the folks who work here. So it's a win-win for everyone. And so one of the main objectives then in empowering the staff is that the staff can carry out the choices of the residents in the most efficient and intimate manner. And so let's think about that in a little bit more detail. To create this empowered environment, first we think about dividing our great big organization maybe into smaller pieces. And so when we think about that, we might call those units um, neighborhoods or households or communities or something like that. But the beauty of having that smaller area is that we can have the same consistent staff who provide the care. Having then the same consistent staff is that it's going to enhance the relationships between the staff and the elders who live and work there. And it only makes sense that when we have fewer residents to get to know, we're going to know them very well and their routine is going to be very utmost in our minds as we provide that service for them. So, as we make that commitment to consistent staffing, it's going to be natural to look at how those workers are going to work as a team then. So we call this self-led work teams, and where the teams plan the work, they carry out the work, and they're responsible for the work. So they're making all the decisions in regards to the work that's going to be done that day. And we call that a decentralized management style. And that is the opposite of a centralized style. Now let me tell you a little bit about centralized style. That's what I think of in the old model. And some of us have been around long enough that maybe we worked in that type of a model um, in long-term care, where there was one person or maybe a small group of people who were making all the decisions. It was very much a, a dictatorial style of management. And so we think then about how do we change that? And we think about the modern model for that, and that is a decentralized style of management, where that old traditional hierarchy 
um, is, is, is wound down. And then we like to remember that with that old medical model, it is really changing how the work flows. And the work we do in the neighborhoods, then it's going to be very close to the residents that we serve. I have a little um, illustration here to help um, tell you about what I mean by centralized and decentralized. And if you can see this, we've got a centralized here where one person or a small group of people is making all the decisions for these folks, but when we decentralize the decisions, we can have all these different pods or groups of people making decisions. And I like to think that in a in long-term care, we could just have so many areas that are making decisions individually for the residents in their area. And I think that's a good thing. So then, we think about that and how these self-led teens are going to work. And I think it's so exciting to see the creativity and the ingenuity of the staff then when they're out there and they're brainstorming to solve problems and they're coming up with new ideas, they're setting goals for their group and it's real, going to really reflect the culture of their particular part of the building or their neighborhood. So, in this style of management, there's really no need or concern to run it up the flagpole with the management to get things done because the staff know they are empowered to carry out these things and it's, and it's for the residents and it's for their best. So, another important piece of this puzzle is how do we get get there and how do we go about setting up a self-led team and these folks are going to be empowered now so the first staff would be for the workers in that neighborhood to choose their own leader amongst themselves and that leader then is going to have decisional authority and she can um, determine when they're going to have regular meetings or meetings as needed and they are going to have that authority then um, to really take care of what's happening out there in the neighborhood. And you know, it really feels so cool to see the um, folks in those roles really blossom and grow. And we've seen staff do this. You know, I think of a housekeeper that we had here for over 20 years, and she was a fantastic gal. And as our culture changed, uh, she had an opportunity to become the team leader in her neighborhood. And as she carried out that work, it was just amazing how effective and wonderful it was. But that's not the end of the story because uh, as time went on, she also became a CNA and a CMA and took training for activities and food service and other things as well. So it's really neat to see how people grow not only longitudinally but latitudinally in this type of environment. So it really makes sense if we're going to have a staff, we're going to be consistent in an area, then our goal is going to have, be to have less staff caring for each resident. And we're going to have to put a high emphasis then on our staff being multitaskers. For example, I'll I think, think back to the old medical model. And you might think about the poor resident who's there. And, just uh, thinking about a day-to-day -day experience where that resident may have dozens and dozens of people coming in and out of her, her space. For example, the resident wakes up in the morning in the old model and somebody gets them up, maybe someone else takes them to the dining room, someone else takes their food order, someone else gets them their medications, someone else does activities and, and rehab and those different things. And so by the end of a 24-hour day, that resident has seen a lot of people. And she's theoretically been training each of one of them to understand her and meet her needs. So now imagine in a new model where the staff are empowered and they're multitasking and they have like these higher level of skills, the person who gets you up in the morning now can um, help you get dressed and do your hair and your teeth and get your medications for you. Maybe she helps you take a shower takes you to the dining room, takes your food order, maybe she even goes in and fixes your breakfast, and she can get your medications and do all these things, even the meaningful activities that you enjoy throughout the day. So we can really imagine how this is going to be very seamless then for the elders that we care for, and very efficient and very meaningful for them. And like I said before, they're not going to, that poor elder's not going to be training uh, numerous people throughout the day to understand what her needs are. So, as we set out to be more consistent with our staff and have fewer people providing an array of services, 
Now we think about how do we diversify our training so our staff can feel comfortable with that. You know, sometimes I think we worry. Um, maybe my staff's not going to be um, into that. You know, I've trained as a CNA and I don't want to learn how to serve food. Well, there's, there's some things to think about in regards to that. And I think staff really are not reluctant to learn new skills. They are just worried that they're not going to be successful. So if we give them the training that they need, they're going to feel confident and be glad to try out those new things. So for instance, let's say we have some CNAs or nurses um, in our neighborhood and a resident wakes up uh, maybe 10.30 in the morning and she wants cinnamon toast and orange juice. How is the staff going to accommodate that? Are they going to feel comfortable being able to provide that for the resident just as she likes it? So there are some really wonderful outcomes that come from that. Um, you know, it's just so cool to see the staff really grow and, and, and find that they can truly make a difference. I was thinking about um, this just the other day. One of our CNAs, um, she had helped the residents in a, in, a, in a book club type of learning experience, and they read this book, Heaven is for Real. And this is just an example of the empowerment that our staff understand. The CNA calls this nationally known author and asks him if he'd like to come to our building for a book signing while he's in Kansas. And by golly, he did it. And so it wasn't something that she went and asked the management, is it okay if I call this nationally known author? But she did it and we celebrate that and we're so proud of our staff for um, approaching things in this very empowered way. And so some things we also see that are very positive for our organization as we empower the staff is that we see a reduction in staff turnover. And you know, and I know, that it is just so devastating when we have a high level of turnover because it's hard to run our programs consistently. And it's really hard on our residents as well. And you know, it just really zaps the energy, the heart and soul of our organization when people leave. Because it makes us sad when somebody in our family is gone. And so, you know, sometimes there is some natural turnover. Maybe you've got some gal who's um, getting married or maybe going back to school, things like that. So let's think about that hiring process just a little bit. They, the, so the staff are going to be doing the interview and making the final selection of the folks who they are going to be working with. Surely if they are putting their eyeballs on this um, new staff person, they're going to make a good um, decision in regards to that hiring process because I've heard it said that the hiring decision is one of the most important decisions we make as an organization. So let's get the team involved. You know, I've been here and been around long-term care long enough to understand how things are in the old nursing home model where the staff had their marching orders and they were very task oriented. Well, you know, we are really blessed with this new model of staff empowerment with a set Staff set out on their own course every day, and not only to look at what's going to happen today, but look into the future and what happens tomorrow. You know, for our organization, these deep system changes have really made an impact for us, especially with the quality of our care. You know, it's led for us to some zero deficiency surveys and some peak awards and some other very positive satisfaction survey results. So. You know, just to kind of sum it up, I can tell you that I am just super proud of my staff for really stepping up to the plate and making staff empowerment happen here in our organization. And I think for all of us, it is an absolutely wonderful time to be in long-term care when we can really make a difference. Imagine what it might be like to have no home. What would it feel like if you were homeless? Things like lost, without identity, wandering, and powerlessness might come to mind. What does home mean to you? For most of us, home means familiarity, comfort, refuge from the world, safety, and memories. A researcher by the name of Judith Carboni who studies homelessness found that persons living in nursing homes share many of the same characteristics as those who are homeless. Feelings such as non-personhood, disconnectedness, meaningless space, without boundaries, powerlessness, dependence, insecurity, uncertainty, and placelessness. Those who had homes in comparison felt identity, connectedness, lived space, 
privacy, power, autonomy, safety, predictability, and journeying. What can we do to help those living the last years of their lives in nursing homes overcome this feeling of homelessness? Some of the solutions reside in the built environment itself, but other solutions in how we interact with the built space. In the medical model, we have often had the mindset that we work in the building to provide care for people who live there. In person-centered care, we're asking you to change your mindset. We work where residents live. We now have to think of ourselves as home health workers, but instead of being in the elder's private home, we're in a community type setting. Having this mindset changes the way we act and behave around the built space. In this mindset, we need to work to make our environments feel less like hospitals and institutions and more like home. Use of residential furnishings and decor, creating spaces that are smaller in scale, eliminating institutional elements like overhead paging and nurses stations, and enhancing privacy are very important. Let's hear from a provider on how some of these things play out in the home. Privacy is something that can be done no matter what your building looks like, no matter how big your building is, no matter how small your building is, privacy can be respected at every level. Knocking on the door, making sure that you respect their wish to close their door. A lot of times we're very fearful in this environment to close doors because we can't keep an eye on them, we can't watch them but you have to take that risk because that is their home and they shouldn't feel like every time somebody walks by their room they're being looked at. That's not very dignified and it's not very home-like. So privacy, respecting that privacy, their personal privacy in their room, giving them that space that they know that they can go after mealtime or after hanging out with their friends, they can go back to that room and have that time where they know they have their own little space that is their home. The other thing is privacy in bathing. Um, the nature of this business is not very many of our buildings have bathrooms or showers in the room. We, there's a common shower room. So what do you do with that shower room? Do you make it homey or do you make it, is it uh, industrial feeling? Does it make them feel like they're going to a locker room shower? Their shower shouldn't look like a locker room. Their shower should look like a bathroom like their home bathroom. So how do we help take our residents homes that they live in before they come to live with us and transplant that into this environment so their home comes with them? How do we bring their home with them? It's really being flexible and allowing them to bring those belongings. And I can give you a few examples of how that's happened here. Uh, we had a, a lady who was into oriental rugs. She had several of them in her house, but she had one that was very, very special to her. Very special oriental rug, and it was always in her dining room. And that was what was home to her. And in this environment, when you hear throw rug, everybody gets all nervous that they're going to trip and they're going to fall, and it's a risk, and it's horrible. And so most people will say, no throw rugs, I'm sorry. Well, we didn't do that. It meant a lot to her. It meant that she was bringing her home with her. So we accepted the risk and we um, educated her and the therapist worked with her to work around that rug and she brought it in and she loved it. And her home, her home in her room was very uh, comfortable and when you went to visit her it really felt like you were visiting her home. She had the thing, she had her candy dish. You know, it just felt like you were sitting in her dining room. She had transplanted her dining room into our building and that's what our job is. So you really have to take that first step even prior to move in or in the few days after move in and really get to know what it's going to take to make them feel like as much this, you know, what room can we bring from your home and, and put it here so it makes you feel like you're at home. When you're talking about the building though in a larger aspect, so many of our long-term care facilities were built back in the day where it was a hospital model and so you have lots of long halls or you don't, they didn't think about common areas. 
they wanted their money in the rooms, so that's where they built things. They didn't build a lot of big common areas. So what can you do to make it feel more like home? The, the most important aspect is to think about getting small. Think about taking this big area and making it smaller somehow. So splitting it up and making it smaller because the less chaos you have, the less staff members you have coming through, uh, the more it's going to feel like home and the less it's going to feel like a hospital. So there were several things. We have a part of our building that was long halls and there are so many things you can do. Look at your hallways and look at the ends of your hallways or look at the places where you have built so much infrastructure for the staff. You know, is there a huge nurses station or are there lots of closets and space for storage that you could rethink? Maybe you could be more efficient in your storage space. Can you repurpose those spaces for either a, a, a nice little nourishment nook or a nice little cozy living room that's not in the traffic area where everybody walks back and forth? Do they have a space where it can be quiet and they can watch their favorite western without the constant distractions? Um, those are things you can think about. So you just have to think about your space and use it differently. The peak domain we will be discussing today is meaningful life and how it relates to the play, uh, in your own facility. Um, what I'm going to first start off with is talking about what the difference between when you hear activities and life enhancement because that comes into play of how you integrate meaningful life into the facility that you work for. So I have two definitions that we're going to start with today. One of them comes from the dictionary on activity. An activity is the condition in which things are happening or being done, which many of us know how that operates within our own facility when we see the activity calendar or the day-to-day -day things happening for the residents. When we talk about activity, now the culture change movement is looking at changing it to life enhancement, how you enhance that life. And the definition for this is a type of spa that is dedicated to helping its guests develop a lifestyle with enhanced health and wellness. Doesn't that sound a little bit more holistic than just looking at what activities need to be done for the day? So what we're going to first start doing is talking about how you can incorporate activity and life enhancement into your facility using that meaningful life. So the first thing I want you to do is kind of look at your own self and how meaningful life plays into your life as it is today. So what I want you to first do is take out a pen and pencil and I want you to think about these questions and answer them honestly of where you're at with them. So the first question is, write down the name of a person who is very important to you. Write down one thing you love to do. Write down one word that represents a favorite memory. Write down one thing you have to do every day or else you, your day is not complete. And write down your occupation. And I hope as you're writing these down, you recognize that these things that you're writing down really play into how you live each and every day and give you the purpose that you live for. So meaningful activities create opportunities for people to express their thoughts and feelings, develop self-esteem, build skills, and build social networks by connecting with others. So as you're moving into a nursing home, how would these meaningful life things that you just wrote down, how would they play into the residents that are coming into your home? How can you enhance their meaningful life for them? So a couple things to keep in mind when you're thinking of meaningful life is there are five ways that you can identify um, the, the creation of those life. One of those is attachment which is where you're connecting with someone. You have an attachment. Some people may look at it as um, an attachment to their material items. They might have a favorite chair, a favorite bed, or a favorite picture. Another is comfort. Where do we find our comfort from? Some of us like to get hugs. Some of us like to have our favorite blanket when we're curled up on the couch. Or we may have an animal that brings us that comfort. Identity. What is each one of our own identities? Some of us are moms, some of us are fathers, some of us are, have an occupation of where we're at at work. That is our own identity as being a nurse. Um, it can also mean who we are as an individual. Occupation is another way we look at meaningful life. What do we do? And the most common question that's asked to people when you first are introduced is, what do you do for a living? It is a very big part of how we identify with ourselves and give us that purpose in life. And inclusion. 
No matter how many times somebody may say that they're okay being on their own, there is a part of being important, of being part of something, being involved in things. So imagine when you first move in to a home and you don't know anybody and the importance of getting someone involved and helping them feel like they are part of a family again because they've just left everything behind. So we just talked about the components of what makes life happen for the residents. So attachment, comfort, identity, occupation, and inclusion. And you also have the list of what is meaningful to you in your own life. So right now we're gonna do a little demonstration of how you can incorporate those or why it's important to look at different things in your own life. So what we're going to do is, here we have a vase, and what we're gonna discuss is Caleb's basket. And this um, came from the Eden Alternative. Um, Dr. Bill Thomas had created this, and so we just took it a step further and did some visual things with it. When we talk about Caleb's basket, it's talking about all of what's important to make meaningful life happen for the residents that we serve each and every day. So the first thing we're gonna talk about when it comes to doing meaningful activities or life is the stones. And here you can see these are bigger stones. In each one of our lives, we have major life-changing events that occur. And that might be a marriage that occurs in the family, um, children, grandchildren being born, buying a car. These are big, major life-changing events that really change how we're going to move forward with certain things. And these are important in our lives, and they depict on what direction we're going for in our lives. And so they do have some purpose. The next one is the pebbles. The pebbles show the day-to-day -day activities and entertainments that we enjoy um, each and every day. So for example, these represent the activities of cooking, cleaning, um, exercising, going to your work, any of those kind of basic activities. And if you think about it, this is a lot of times what we find what we do in our, in our homes and how we help the residents have activities in their own homes too. So as you can see, when you put these into the vase, it kind of fills in the gaps of the bigger pebbles, the stones, because those are the things that we incorporate day to day from those life changing events of what we're doing. And as we're moving forward with our life, then we have um, the unexpected pleasures and happenings of daily life. So these are the things that um, just kind of happen on spur of the moment, that we don't plan for them to happen, they're not on our calendar, but we just go enjoy them. So as these are occurring, which these are examples of maybe hopping in the car and going getting ice cream, or getting a spontaneous phone call from a family or friend just to say hello, um, and so, or giving and receiving, and as you can see, as it's filling in between both the big rocks, which are life-changing events, and the smaller rocks, it fills in those gaps. So these daily pleasures are what kind of helps us keep that meaningful life and meaningful purpose. As we're going forward then, the last thing that helps, because as you can see, there's still a little bit of gaps in there, but they are being filled as we're going along. The water represents the relationships that flow through our lives. And as you can see, when the water goes into the vase, it fills in all the gaps that are around that. So you need all of these to make it meaningful for a resident. So for example, with these relationships that through, flow through our lives, it could be a sister that's your relationship, a friend, or even as we work in um, a facility, the caregivers can help with those relationships. And as we talk about staff empowerment and moving forward with the movement, um, staff empowerment with smaller areas, so you really get to know the residents, consistent staffing. If, can you imagine that if you're working on the same hallway every single day, how much more you'll get to know the residents to understand what the grains of sands mean to them, what the pebbles mean, and their major life-changing events. It can be their memories, or maybe it's a 50th wedding anniversary, or 60th wedding anniversary that's coming up, how you can incorporate that into their lives to make a difference. So as you think about the Caleb's basket and this major, the bigger stones, the pebbles, the grain, or the sand, and the water, what I also want you to think about, what are those things that represent your own life and how those play into that? And think about the questions that we answered before. Many of those questions that you answer about, write down the name of a person who is very important to you, fulfills that water. Because if you did not have that relationship, a lot of this stuff cannot happen. So I challenge you to go back and think about where are those all incorporated into your own life? And what do you know about the residents to help that incorporate into them moving into your home? 
because without purpose there is no life and we want to make a difference for those residents. The last thing I want to talk about is a lot of times we look at activities within the home and what we end up focusing on is those pebbles, the day-to-day -day activities. Um, so it's not uncommon that if you walk into a facility you'll see some kind of cooking happening or reading or watching a movie. Those are important day-to-day -day activities and we don't want those to go away. What we don't want to see though is if I walk in and we have four or five different activity calendars from different facilities, if we put them all in a pile, could we identify where they came from based off the activities? A lot of times you'll see the same consistent things happening like bingo, which bingo is important too, but how else can we meet those needs? And not everything can be put onto a calendar. So if you're meeting those, those pleasure needs of the sand, uh, those may not be on the calendar, but it takes only just a few moments to meet that need to make a difference for the resident and it doesn't take much time. So as you're going forward, make sure you're paying attention to what are those things the residents really enjoy that you can incorporate in to the life of the house. The other thing is to think about is what the individual likes. Um, again, sometimes we focus on the recreation or sometimes that physical or emotional need of the resident, but there's a lot more to meeting a resident's need. What's their education background? Is there a volunteer that we can help bring in that they can either tutor somebody or help teach a class? Um, what about their spiritual needs um, and their cognitive? So it takes learning the whole person and not just one avenue of something to get to know them even better. So if someone really does enjoy um, reading a book, and that is great, we're meeting one of those needs, but how can we take it a step further and meet another need for them also at the same time? Person-centered care is a journey of deep organizational change and personal transformation. Have you started your journey? Peak 2.0 is a program here to help you on that road. Join us today.